Thank you, George. And good morning. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Ben for having us out here at Cabin Camp. Uh, I can't believe there are enough of you to uh, gather up in one place to listen to me talk about this. Uh, I've been a student of the five string banjo since 1971. That's 50 years for those of you that don't do the math. It's scary to me. Uh, and so uh, this really has been my passion. I, I got interested in Gibson master tones because that's what was available in the area of Florida where I grew up. Uh, and when I was just starting out, I read an article in uh, Bluegrass Unlimited magazine written by somebody named George Groon. Uh, in which he had sort of categorized all the different kinds of pre-war Gibson master tone banjos. And I just thought, wow, that was cool uh, because I'm that kind of a geeky guy. Uh, I'm interested in history. I'm a professional genealogist. Uh, you know, that, that kind of taxonomic categorization of things just fell right in line with me. So uh, I started out on a Gibson RB100 and, and I've always played Gibson banjos uh, my entire career. Uh, I was a professional musician for a long time. I worked in the recording studios down in Central Florida. Uh, I worked in the theme parks. I toured. I was a road dog, yes, back in the days before cell phones, uh, when it was really tough. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just one of you guys, and, and I'm very lucky uh, that I get now to work for George and, and come talk to people like you about Gibson banjos. All right, so what I'm going to specifically talk to you about today is how the master tone developed uh, and even where the word itself comes from. Uh, and uh, so I get, to, I get to start with Lloyd Lore. Lloyd Lore, Gibson's famous acoustic engineer. Now, you'll pretty quickly discern that I don't drink the Kool-Aid, okay? I'm, I'm not a fan, okay? I think that what actually happened was something like this. Lore was a mandolin player who had been around for quite a while, about a decade, and he played Gibson instruments. After World War I ended, Lore came back to the States from France. He served in France during the war as an ambulance driver. And he was good friends with the general manager at Gibson, a man named Lewis Williams. Now, how many of you have ever like tried to read a Gibson catalog from the 20s? Just raise your hand if you've, if you've ever done that. You haven't, ah, oh, Ben has. The language used in those catalogs is insane. The flowery adjectives and the way that they describe those instruments. Lewis Williams was the guy that wrote those catalogs, okay? He was an early adherent of marketing, what we would now call the science of marketing, uh, which was in its infancy at that time. And I think what Lewis Williams saw in his friend Lloyd Lohr was a marketing opportunity. Because the, the contemporary accounts we have of Lohr is that nobody thought more of Lohr than Lohr himself. He was extremely opinionated, he was an intelligent guy, but extremely opinionated and, and probably drew conclusions from his own thought processes that he shouldn't have. And I'll demonstrate a little more of that as we go along. So I think that Lewis Williams saw that opportunity to bring in Lloyd Lohr as the acoustic engineer. Now, just to, to provide a little uh, context there, at that time, and he was hired in 1919, at that time there was no university program that granted a degree in acoustic engineering. It didn't exist. There was no such thing. The scientific instruments for the empirical study of sound years into the future. There was no such thing as an oscilloscope, microphones were in their infancy, and there was no such thing as a vacuum tube at that time. Didn't exist. So basically, whatever ideas Lore had about sound were things that he had decided in his own mind and then drawn conclusions from. He was an acoustic engineer. Lou Williams loved it because he had something he could point to and say, nanner, nanner, boo, boo, we got one and you don't. Okay, so he put lore to work, supposedly, uh, improving various aspects of the Gibson instruments, and the employees in the factory were told to call him, wait for it, Master Lore. Can you imagine the resentment? I mean, uh, how they adored him. 
So he was master lore. They gave him a little corner on the second floor of the factory that was the experimental lab. Even took a picture of him there holding one of his uh, ten string mando violas with a bunch of tools around. I personally don't think Lore even knew what those tools were, but you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. So, um, so you've got master Lore working there. All right, so how did Lore improve the banjo, those Gibson banjos? Well, <clears throat> he had some pretty strange ideas. For example, I'll give you, I'll give you an, a perfect example of that. This 1924 RB3, uh, by the way, he, he, would object, he would have objected strenuously to calling this a resonator. This was a tone projector. Not, in fact, he wrote a whole article about how this is not a resonator. It's a tone projector on the back. All right, you'll notice that it has an oval-shaped sound hole. See that? Oval-shaped sound hole. That's because round sound holes are evil. He wrote an article about it. Round sound holes are not good. So all those pre-war Martin guitars, George, they have the wrong shape sound hole. Sorry. Right. No, George doesn't go for that. Okay, so oval shaped sound hole because that's... His were oval, right, right, exactly. But Laura wrote a whole whole article about this. It's crazy, crazy stuff. There's a reason nobody's ever published his treatises, his, his articles. Yeah, because it wouldn't sell. But that was Lore. <clears throat> All right, so Gibson already had a basic sort of a tone ring design at that point when, when Lore took over. Uh, and he would have come into the picture kind of late in 1923, maybe early 24, as far as the banjos were concerned. And his design was something that we today call a ball-bearing tone ring. How many of you you are familiar? Raise your hand if you, you know a ball-bearing tone ring, okay? Ball-bearing tone ring. And this that I brought to show you today is the, the tone tube portion of a ball-bearing tone ring system, okay? A ball-bearing tone ring system has 100 parts. 48 flat washers, 24 springs, 24 ball bearings, um, this, the tone tube, which has three parts to it, and then a, a metal skirt, an exterior skirt, that holds it all together. 100 parts. Lore, in his, he wrote an article about the ball bearing tone ring system too, by the way. Uh, in his article about the ball bearing tone ring system, which, which by the way, that's something called a present ism. When we take uh, a term and apply it to something from the past, uh, they never called it a ball bearing tone ring system at Gibson. This was the floating head system. Floating head. Ball bearing is something that we have applied to it because it has ball bearings. This system, Lore said that it was superior because of the ball bearings. This, this rested on the ball bearings, which rested on a flat washer, which rested on those little springs, which rested on another flat washer in, in some holes that were drilled in the rim. Very complex system. Lore said this was superior because, are you ready for this? I don't think you are. The ball bearings reduced friction. What friction is he talking about? I have no idea. But the ball bearings reduced friction. Um, so Gibson actually went with that. Uh, they fired Lore in December of 1924, uh, but in 1925 they continued with this ball bearing system, and you see it in that RB3 right there. And they used it in in 25 and 26. By sort of the end of 1926, they realized that putting together a banjo with a hundred parts in the tone ring system, uh, and then can you imagine trying to put a wet skin head on it, uh, you know, mount that skin head. Any of you who've, who've done that, you realize what a struggle that is. Well, imagine doing it on a master tone ring that has a hundred parts you're trying to hold in place. Uh, they realized that wasn't a very good idea. It wasn't, uh, didn't make good economic sense in the factory. So they designed a cast brass tone ring, this right here. So we have 100 parts that are replaced with one. One part. And the machinist in the shop machined down the lathe, dropped the tone ring on it, done. Okay? Nothing to hold in place while you're putting that 
wet calfskin head on there. And no more friction. Or maybe more friction. I don't know. Anyway, um, this is what we call uh, a raised head or arch top tone ring. And it's, it's, one, it's the very first design for a Gibson Master Tone tone ring, dates to 1927. Um, we don't actually know what they called this. Okay, I, I've, I've got a lot of the factory records, but I, I've never seen a factory record that describes this. Uh, the word arch top tone ring or raised head tone ring is another presentism. Uh, we, we use that word, but we don't know what they used. These tone rings <clears throat> were cast right down the street from the Gibson factory in Kalamazoo at a place called the Star Brass Works. Star Brass Works had been in business since uh, the late 19th century and their main product was this. This is a trolley electrical pickup wheel. So, you know, your trolley, your street trolley running down the street. This is the little wheel that's on the top of the pole that contacts the wire, that runs down the wire and picks up the electricity. Uh, their, their main claim to fame was that these uh, little trolley wheels lasted a long time. They were very hard and you didn't have to replace them very often. So that was their main product. That's a real Star Brass Works trolley wheel from about the same period. Less friction. Awesome, yes. Now, why did Gibson choose the Star Brass Works? Was it because there was some metallurgist at Gibson that specialed in alloys and, and, he, and he'd gone to college and he knew all that? No, afraid not. As far as I can tell from my study of the Gibson employees, there was no employee at Gibson that knew the first thing about metallurgy, okay? I'm sure they picked Star Brass because it was right down the street. Okay? and they got a low bid to do it. Was there some kind of special alloy that they used to make these tone rings? Eh, who knows, probably not. They probably left it up to the, to the foundrymen at Star Brass to decide, is it the same alloy as this? No. Uh, I've been asked that question a lot of times. Uh, the, again, the claim to fame for these trolley wheels is that they were long wearing, long lasting, and that's a, that's a brass alloy that's very hard. It wouldn't have made a very good tone ring. This, this brass alloy here is, is quite a bit softer. Now, another question I get asked is why the holes? Why does it have holes drilled in it? Good question. Less friction. Less friction. Less air resistance. Compression release port. Maybe to make it look like this, the earlier, the earlier thing. We really don't know why they did that. I can tell you that my, uh, my friend and my former boss, Steve Huber, did some empirical testing, some actual scientific testing of tone rings that have holes drilled and tone rings that don't. Brass castings that don't have holes drilled are stiffer. They don't vibrate as easily. They offer more resistance to the vibration of the strings and tone rings with holes drilled in them vibrate more easily, offer less resistance, and create a sort of a richer overtone series in the note. That's scientific fact. Steve Huber can show you uh, the scientific uh, results on that. Is that the reason Gibson did it? Oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure somebody in the production office called down to Starbrass and said, hey, let's drill some holes in those tone rings. Make them more more rich, more overtoned series. No, I, I don't think that's what happened. I think that probably they drilled the holes because they wanted to make it look like this. Okay, raised head or arch top tone rings. All right, so how do we get from this to this, which is a flathead tone ring? How did that happen? They don't even look the same. They aren't the same height. The shape is very different. How did that happen? I think that we can point to this guy right here. His name was Claude Clay Rowden, C.C. Rowden. I think it's the fault of this guy right here. Claude Clay Rowden was a music teacher in Chicago, and he was an early adherent of Gibson Instruments. 
He played, you know, a little bit of everything. He was a classical five-string banjo player. He knew Fred Van Epps. He knew Fre Fred Bacon. He knew Samuel Swain Stewart. Uh, he was one of these early guys that played classical banjo using his thumb and fingers, you know, in a sort of similar way to what we would do. Okay, so he was already doing that. He was teaching in Chicago. He knew the people at Gibson. Uh, you know, he was well known to them. Now, so how does that influence this? All right, a few years ago at the store, at Mr. Groom's store, we had a matched set of pre-war Gibson master tone banjos come into the store. One was an original five string and the other was a tenor. They were both uh, the Bella Voce model, which was very, very fancy Gibson banjo, customized banjo. Well, this was a matched set that were made for Emil Zarwas, okay? Emil Zarwas turns out to be a student of this guy in Chicago. Okay, uh, and they're, they're gorgeous, gorgeous things with an extended fingerboard on the five string. Noam Pakelny would love it. Um, and I had a chance to take them apart and look at them. Well, the five string banjo is a flathead, okay? But it dates to January of 1928. It's way, way too early to be something like this banjo here. January of 1928, it should have this tone ring in it. So how can it possibly be a flathead? And the flathead ring doesn't look exactly like this either. It's not the, the what we call the face on the inside is not as deep. And along this bearing edge, it has a little bead, something like the bead on the top of this uh, ball bearing tone ring here. It's a flathead tone ring. It was real, original to the banjo, but not exactly like a modern flathead tone ring. But the most incriminating thing, on the tone ring face, in pencil, someone had written 4CC Rowden. Okay? In the same handwriting that you see uh, the chalk numbers on the inside of, of Gibson resonators. Yes, I know that. I've studied the handwriting. Uh, so it says 4CC Rowden on that tone ring, all right? So that's interesting. So here's a, a, a very strange January 1928 original five-string pre-war Gibson master tone with a very strange flathead tone ring in it for one of the students of Claude Clay Rowden in Chicago. So why would Claude Clay Rowden have ordered a banjo like this for one of his students with this weird tone ring? And I think the answer lies in the fact that he was a five-string banjo player, okay? Because this idea, this shape of a flathead tone ring, like so many other things, didn't originate at Gibson. George would tell you that Bacon made a very similar shaped flathead tone ring that they used in their banjos. Samuel Swain Stewart, S.S. Mm -hmm. Stewart banjos, also have a rim system where the head is stretched all the way out to the edge of the rim and it's flat all the way across. I think, and I can't prove it yet, but I think that's what happened. I think C.C. Rowden went to Gibson and when these banjos were ordered and he said, hey, you know, these banjos that I've played before have a, a head that's flat all the way across, and it gives a little more bass response, and it's better for what? Finger style. Not using a pick, but finger style. I think that's what happened. Uh, and I have yet to prove that, but I think we can thank C.C. Rowden for the flathead tone ring. So that's January of 28. We don't really see very many original pre-war flathead tone rings uh, prior to uh, about late 28 or January of 29. And those tone rings aren't exactly like this in that they don't weigh three pounds. They have this same profile, those early rings, but they're light. Most of them weigh about two pounds and they have more metal turned out of the inside here, what we call the gutter. More metal turned out in here, but other than that, they're interchangeable. Uh, so why did Gibson go from that tone ring to a three pound tone ring? Was there somebody sitting there in Gibson at the development office that said, hey, let's get some tone rings of different weights and try them on banjo rims and see which one sounds better? No, not hardly. I think this is what happened. 
The Star Brass Works, these people, did the machining on these rings before they were sent to the plater and delivered to Gibson. I think that after they made the first batch of flathead tone rings, the machinist probably went to somebody in the main office and said, hey, it's killing me to stand there and cut all that metal out of the inside of this gutter. Could you call down to Gibson and see if we left a little more of that metal in there, if it would be okay? Because if you don't have to machine all of that metal out there, it's faster and, more importantly, cheaper. And Gibson always wanted faster and cheaper. So I think that the reason that they settled on about a three pound ring is just because that was what was easiest to do. Now, why can't we reproduce this tone ring today? And by the way, this is not a pre-war flathead master tone tone ring. I wouldn't be walking around with it if it was. This is a modern uh, Tennessee 20 tone ring, but it looks like a pre-war ring. Why can't we reproduce this today? And why do so many people have the pre-war formula for flathead tone rings? Well, the reason is because this process that created these rings was an artisan process, an artisanal process. Okay? The, the foundrymen that did the casting learned their trade from other master foundrymen, and it was passed down from person to person to person. Did they have recipe books for alloys? Absolutely. But that's only the start of a process like this. The final product in any brass casting depends on many, many things. How big the cup is that you heat, when you put the metals in, how long you cook the metals, how hot the metal is when you pour it, how many castings you make, all of those things change the final product. So the reason, in short, that we can't make this tone ring today is we don't have the Star Brass Works facility and we don't have the foundryman. We don't know exactly how his process worked. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. All right, so <clears throat> an alloy like this is not a chemical compound. It's an alloy, okay? It's just a mixture of different base metals. Uh, there's nothing, nothing electrical holding this together. The atoms are not bonded with one another. They've just cooled into this position. All right, different metals cook off, evaporate, out of the crucible at different temperatures, okay? So if you, if you put all the, the, the copper and the tin and the lead into the crucible and you heat it up and it's all molten and you've got your green sand boxes down here with the tone ring impressions in them. And now you're, you bring the crucible over and you're ready to pour these tone rings. Okay, say you've got 50 sand boxes laid out there, okay? You're gonna pour 50 tone rings, right? Because you're not gonna do two. This is Gibson, you know, they need them in quantity. So let's say you're gonna do 50. All right, so you bring the crucible over and you tilt it and you pour the metal into that first sand a mold, and then you bring it to the next one, and the metal is cooking, and it's cooking, and it's cooking. And remember, the tin is cooking off faster than the lead, and, and the copper is cooking off slower than everything else, and you're pouring, and you're pouring, and you're pouring. What's happening, folks? Changing. It's changing. So this tone ring over here is significantly different than this tone ring over there, and that's what happened. So when people sample these tone rings today and get a metallurgical analysis, they're all what? Slightly different. So I know the real formula. Now, you know, one of the formulas, you know, what do we, we have an idea about what they were shooting for. There's a particular alloy in the, in the foundry books at that time that pretty well describes what we see when we analyze these rings, but they weren't able to hold tolerances that close, okay? So, so pre-war rings are all a little bit different from one another, uh, and I think Alan would probably agree with me that some pre-war tone rings are better than others. Uh, I've played pre-war master tones that I wouldn't give you 50 bucks for, and, and others that were really great. And part of that is because of these rings are different. <laughs> yeah, he would, he'd give 50 bucks for it. That's my boss, folks, there he is, George Groom. Um, so, that's why, you know, we can get close, you know, people like my, my old boss, Steve Huber, he studied it really extensively, and he can get close, but the foundry doesn't exist. 
the foundryman is long dead. Okay? Another process that makes these different is a process called deoxidation. Uh, while the metal is hot, uh, any foundryman today will tell you they put a compound in there to drive the oxygen out, uh, you know, before they, do the, before they pour the casting so that there are no voids in the casting. Every foundryman in the United States in the early 20th century had a different way to do that. He had a different chemical to do that. He added it at a different time, or he might have just not even cared what time he added it, and it was added at different times, you know, depending on whichever batch. Uh, of things he was casting. So the process is artisanal, not scientific, and it can't really be duplicated. All right, what makes this banjo right here in the center the most desired pre-war Gibson Master Tone banjo? Right, this banjo dates from 1929. So the distance, now this is incredible, the distance from that banjo to this banjo is only five years. That's how quickly things were changing. Only five years difference from that to this, okay? Why are we interested in this banjo? Well, basically it's because the first generation of bluegrass banjo players used these banjos, okay? Snuffy Jenkins, Earl Scruggs, Don Reno, Ralph Stanley, they all used these pre-war Gibson master tone banjos. That's why we're interested. Are there banjos today, modern banjos that are great? You bet. I've played some that were awesome. Better than pre-war master tones. <laughs> heresy, heresy. Uh, but this banjo, this is, this is Gibson's 1929 version of their product. All right, so what makes it different? All right, so you'll notice the peg head shape. This is what we call a double cut peg head. Okay. It's very different from the fiddle peg head you see there or on the Paramount banjo. Gibson actually came up with this design in 1928 and I think it was in response to pressure from William Lang, the man that owned the Paramount company. So, you know, they changed uh, that design. <laughs> Unfortunately, they stole it from S.S. Stewart. <laughs> Anybody who's had an S.S. Stewart banjo, uh, especially the presentation models, will recognize that. It's, they just couldn't come up with their own ideas, I guess. But So that's different. But then also, the stretcher band, what some of you call the tension hook, and the flange are different on this banjo. How are they different? Well, put that right there. They're made of a, of a compound called Zamac which was a proprietary alloy of the Dollar Die Casting Company in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, die casting under high pressure was kind of a new technology then. Zamac was a very, very brand new alloy at that time. But Gibson found out that, that uh, Dollar could make this flange and this stretcher band pretty cheaply. And Gibson was always interested in faster and cheaper. Also because it's one piece, it doesn't have two pieces, a tube and a plate, it's easier to assemble. So once again, less parts, faster assembly, cheaper cost. Remember, it's a factory. Now, the problem was it was really an experimental alloy. In fact, some of these banjos, the very earliest ones from about mid-year 1929, have what we call proto-Zamac flanges. Okay? Dollar, <laughs> in an attempt to reduce costs, in their earliest Zamac, purchased base metals that were contaminated. They weren't really very pure, okay? So when they heated them up, molded them together, and shot them into the injection mold, um, pretty quickly those contaminants caused something called intergranular corrosion, okay? It makes the flange not shiny anymore, and the stretcher band too. It looks kind of dull and pitted. That's actually a process of electrical repulsion that's going on in there inside the flange uh, because of these contaminants called intergranular corrosion. And a lot of those early stretcher bands and flanges disintegrated immediately, okay, because it, they, they didn't have their process down. Uh, at home, I have the blueprint for that flange right there. And the engineering changes are noted 
uh, in a box up in the upper left hand corner of the print. And they made changes to this flange like every two weeks trying to get it right. Okay? They changed the alloy, they bought pure metals, uh, they increased the uh, inside diameter, uh, I'm sorry, reduced the inside diameter of the flange uh, to make it stronger. Dollar really worked hard quickly to provide Gibson with a better product. So by about 1932 or 33, you'll see banjos like this, that the flanges and the plating look as smooth as the plating on that tone ring. Why is that? Because the alloy they're made of is uh, made from pure base metals. There isn't uh, contaminant inside the base metal. All right, so this banjo then has this one-piece Zamac flange. It has a one-piece uh, Zamac stretcher band. It's got a three-pound flathead tone ring. It's got a three-ply maple rim in it. It's got a mahogany neck. For whatever reason, that's the secret sauce, okay? Was there somebody at Gibson that said, oh, Zamac, it's the metal of the future. It'll make the banjo sound exactly like Earl Scruggs will want it. Of course not. <laughs> it's somewhat an accident of history that we have this, okay? Bluegrass music didn't exist. There certainly were three finger style players at that time. Uh, but it's a very happy accident that we have, we have these banjos. Yes? How did you acquire that blueprint? Um, you'll never believe this. Uh, I got a call. I was working for Steve Huber. Uh, and I got a call from a guy down in Murfreesboro, uh, and he said, uh, well, I've read your book, and uh, you know, I've got some blueprints. I used to live in Kalamazoo. Right. And I, I didn't question where he got them. Right. And he says, well, you can have them if you want them. I said, I'll be right there. Wow. So uh, he had that, and he had uh, the architectural uh, drawings for the factory. Wow. Uh, and so, so I got those. So this is geeky, but yesterday I saw an ad for Gibson was at 203 Parsons. Mm -hmm. And I know that Gibson's at 225 Parsons. Mm -hmm. Did it move? And, no, they eventually bought the entire block. Okay. okay? And the business office right. uh, was actually in a house at 203 for a, a period of time. So that, you know, they wanted the mail delivered there rather than to the factory. But it's an interesting question. Not geeky at all, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Huh? Ah, yes. What's the model of that banjo? Oh, this is an RB3. This is the same thing. RB3, RB3, RB3. Now, this one went back, or I should say the neck, went back to the factory in 1949 uh, for a refret. And instead, they took the entire fingerboard off and put a bow tie fingerboard on it. Okay? Because why? It was faster and cheaper. You know, why, why worry with pulling the old frets and leveling the board and putting in the new frets and putting the dining back on. Nah, just get out the hot palette knife, skim the old board off and pop this one on there, boom, ready to go. Yeah. You know. Like Scruggs did. Exactly, exactly. This one went back in 49, Scruggs Granada went back in 50 uh, and got the same treatment. Uh, we have a little TB4 at the shop uh, from this period uh, that went back in 41. Uh, ostensibly to be refretted, and instead it came back completely refinished, beautifully. It's factory refinished, and it has a wreath fingerboard on it instead of hearts and flowers. Uh, and those are other presentisms too, by the way. Uh, I just throw that out there. We call them hearts and flowers, and flying eagle, and wreath, and diamonds and squares. They didn't have names. They didn't have names for them. I've got a I've got a hearts and flowers fingerboard from the period that got never, was never used for some reason. And on the back in pencil is just written number four, you know, because it was for a, like a, an RB4 or a TB4 or whatever. Jim? The, the ball bearing and springs, when they invented that, that was not to maintain tension when you're using a calf skin head? Absolutely not. So as I said earlier, Lore wrote an entire treatise on this floating head, don't call it ball bearing, floating head system. And he says, right straight up, the ball bearings are there to reduce friction. And you're reducing the surface area that's making contact with the rim. Oh, okay. <laughs> makes no sense to me. Like, like a lot of what Laura wrote, it makes no sense to me. And, and empirically, you know, if we look at it scientifically now, it, <laughs> No, no, uh, 
it doesn't make any sense. With the ball bearings and the, and the springs out of them? Uh, yeah, and you know, ball bearing banjos as a general rule produce beautiful tone, you know, so maybe Laura was right, I don't know. Uh, but they produce beautiful tone, but not a lot of volume. And, and ever since I've been a kid, I've seen people take the ball bearings, the washers and the springs out and then take this, the tone tube and flip it over and reinstall it this way to make a flat surface. And it works that way too, you know.